Hi everyone, welcome to the NHJ Student Projects, El Grito Across the Rockies. I'm Miguel Labadina, project lead. For the third straight year, we brought students from across the country for a multimedia boot camp, print. Some web reporting. Uh, writing a package, an online story. Audio, and shoot, now I'm drawing a blank. Online photo. Video, audio, print. The most challenging was definitely photojournalism. Video, photo, audio. Shot a little bit of video. We did print, video, audio, and photo. I did it all. We are really training the students of today to be the digital journalists of, well, right now. It's so important for young journalists to learn how to speak to people in a variety of media, as well as how to think about what's the best way to present your story. Lita Beck is our co-director. Our 30 specialized mentors are multimedia. They've mastered the art of multitasking, creating, and most importantly, holding true to our journalism mission. Following the truth wherever it takes you. Following the truth means to report everything as accurate, accurately as possible. We tell our students journalism has no platform. You know, there's some things that you could do better. So all week they've worked at creating content. You know, different angles, different techniques. Learning lessons. Uh, to go over and over and over your work. Bringing Latino voices and faces to the forefront. Y es importante tener eh, periodistas hispanos para que puedan denunciar esos, esos eventos con la importancia que ameritan. They've compiled two newspapers, a show you'll see in just a short bit, and audio. All of our content ends up right here on our website, latinoreporterdigital.org. At the same time, in student campus, 20 students take up home at Colorado University Boulder, where they go through mock press conferences, career building exercises, get a real perspective of the working world of journalism. It's five grueling days of hard work, commitment, and most importantly, learning. But in the end, it is all worth it as we put our faith in the future of journalism. And now, let's introduce El Noticiero 2010. From the Rocky Mountains, Las Rocallosas in Denver, Colorado, this is El Noticiero 2010. Bienvenidos al Noticiero 2010. Soy José Antonio Acevedo. I'm Amanda Rivas. And I'm Marlene Salinas. We're here in beautiful Confluence Park in Denver, Colorado. A park located right in the middle of the Mile High City. El lugar donde se unen dos cuerpos de agua, el Arroyo Cherry y el Río South Platte. Denver is the capital city of this state and has 205 parks making it the largest city park system in the nation. The city is located on the high Great Plains east of the Rocky Mountains. And if you're wondering why it's called the Mile High City, it's because the elevation is approximately 5,280 feet above sea level. Y este año, la ciudad que se avecina a las montañas rocallosas es la sede de la Convención de la Asociación Nacional de Periodistas Hispanos. Cientos de periodistas llegaron a la ciudad para aprender los nuevos cambios en nuestra industria. Pero lo más importante es poder tener la oportunidad de conocer a nuevos colegas en los medios de comunicación. Thanks, Jose. Though Denver is a busy and populated city, don't let the bright lights and high rises fool you. The city is actually rich in history and culture. Digital reporter Robert Guadarrama takes us back to the birth of this thriving city. Fresh air, trickling water, and warm sun make up the scene of this hidden gem of Denver. What seems like an ordinary park is actually rich with mile-high history. This is Confluence Park, a hot spot for locals and visitors to come hang out and cool off. Its popularity, though, isn't a new thing. As a matter of fact, this is where Denver was born. Well, there was nothing here. Uh, absolutely nothing at all. And then some prospectors from Georgia came and they found some gold right here where Cherry Creek and the South Platte River joined. As the gold frenzy exploded, miners settled in an area known today as Larimer Square. So in two years, 100,000 men uh, walked here. But after a 600-mile walk, people wanted some city comforts and they wanted hotels and uh, maybe a drink and food, better food. And so the city grew right here to supply the people on the way to the mountains. 
Larimer Square, or St. Charles, as it was called in the mid-1800s, was home to Denver's first bank, bookstore, post office, and theater. Larimer Street became the biggest street in the city at that time. Larimer Square has evolved into a stylish and trendy block while still staying true to its rich past. It's the, the chicest, trendiest, hippest block in the city. And it always feels pleasant. It's lit up at night. It's kind of a festive, fun area to be. And this is Denver. This is this speaks Denver. It's 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 different than uh, than a mall you can get anywhere. Larimer Square is the original Denver, and after 150 years, this chic part of town is still the heart of the city. Robert Guadarrama, El Noticiero, 2010. Now if you want to take a stroll down Larimer Square, go to latinodigitalreporter.org and take a look at some of the cool shops and galleries you definitely have to check out. Y muchos de ustedes ya conocen al oso azul frente al centro de convenciones. El oso mide 40 pies de altura y originalmente tenía que ser de color natural, pero al ver el producto final salió azul. El título de esta pieza es Entiendo lo que quieres decir, lo que significa la curiosidad que tiene la gente fuera del centro. Y un pedazo de autopista en Denver es tema de controversia, ya que pertenece a un grupo anti-inmigrante. Periodista digital Giselle Bueno nos cuenta cómo fue que ellos obtuvieron el tramo de la autopista. 20 millas al norte de la ciudad de Denver se encuentra la autopista 85, la cual está rodeada de paisajes hermosos. Pero no todo es tan hermoso, porque existe algo que no toda la gente conoce. No. Se tiene que poner mucha atención y observar detenidamente. El letrero describe que la autopista fue adoptada por el Movimiento Socialista Nacional, o mejor conocido como los neonazis. Los neonazis, como se pueden observar aquí. When we first heard that this group was interested, we were very disappointed and, and wanted to deny them. La comunidad se pregunta cómo el Departamento de Transportación permitió que tal grupo adoptara una carretera pública. They're responsible for going out and picking up the trash and keeping it looking nice. Since we talked to the Attorney General's office, we talked to the ACLU, and all said that we can't disqualify them. Enfrente de la carretera se encuentra una iglesia, y sus miembros opinan que es solo una acción publicitaria de los neonazis. I think they just want to get their name out to the public, you know, let everybody know that maybe they want to change their image, I'm not sure. Él es Neolan, el líder del grupo, el cual se negó rotundamente a darme una entrevista en el momento que se enteró que la historia era para la Asociación Hispana de Periodistas, diciendo que éramos unos racistas y que no teníamos por qué cubrir la historia, usando malas palabras hacia mí y hacia la comunidad hispana. Giselle Bueno, El Noticiero, 2010. Y un inmigrante que ha dado mucho de qué hablar es Enrique González. Nuestra reportera Génesis Samayoa nos dice cómo Enrique pudo convertir un pedazo de madera a un tesoro familiar. Bueno, todo empezó todo mi alrededor de, no sé, 80, 100 años, con mi abuelo. Para Enrique González, trabajar con madera se ha convertido en un hábito natural. Que construía carretas y se las vendía a los españoles, las, las a, exportaban hacia la Ciudad de México, de Torreón, Coahuila. Esta madera es a uh, cedar. González ha utilizado madera reciclada desde antes de que el medio ambiente entrara en crisis. Toda la madera que usamos, como puedes ver hacia el fondo, es, es, todo es madera obtenida de, de ranchos, de viejas construcciones. Y siempre enfatiza que su estilo es único. Ah, de ahí, bueno, pues se lo pasó a mi abuelo y mi abuelo le enseñó a mis, a mis tíos, a mi papá, a hacer muebles. Yo tuve la idea de hacer algo parecido, ¿me entiendes? Mueble rústico fino, pero ya aún con mi estilo. Okay. Ahora, su hijo será la sexta generación exportadora de tan vieja bueno, tradición. Es ahora, como te digo, desde ahora ya hace muebles, le gusta, siempre está involucrado en lo que es el taller, le gusta crear. Y es por eso que el pequeño Enrique ya tiene un lugar dentro del taller para darle vida a sus creaciones. Bueno, a ver, líjalo un poco más, te faltó en las esquinas, mira. Genesis Amayoa, El Noticiero 2010. And One Latino Family has brought sabor latino to downtown Denver. Digital journalist Nicole Travis 
shows us how one Peruvian family has brought authentic dishes to the streets of the Mile High City. Sí, me encanta la comida peruana. Vengo aquí cada semana. Es como la comida que hace mi familia, comida casera. Me recuerda mucho a mi abuelita, a mis tías, a mi papá. No, este, tiene muchos recuerdos. Mi esposo hace 22 años tuvo la idea de, de traer nuestra cultura aquí en Denver, Colorado. ¿no? El arroz con pollo, ¿no? yo le he hecho este, ají amarillo, como te digo que el ají amarillo es el ADN de la comida peruana. La gente le gusta mucho porque nuestros platos son auténticos, se cocinan como en casa. El sabor peruano lo describiría como muy, muy sabroso. Como diciendo, mmm, qué rica es la comida peruana. The World Cup is in full effect. Local bars and restaurants are opening up their doors extra early for all those special soccer lovers. If you want to check out some pictures, log on to latinodigitalreporter.org. Colorado Rapids captain, Pablo Mastroeni, he's been a part of two World Cup teams. That said, Pablo has inspired plenty of young folks, including the little fan digital journalist, Paul Barron, found earlier this week. Sorry, do it, Polly. Along the sideline at the Colorado Rapids practice field, pretty big thing, sits a nine-year-old soccer book. Yeah. Yeah, they do it 20 times every day. Marco Babic has his favorites. Connor, Casey, or Pablo? He's been a fan of Pablo Mastroni since his what? father told him about him uh, a few years back. My dad thinks I'm as fast as him. No, not really, but he, he thinks I'm as good as him, so. Pablo, an Argentinian-born soccer player. He's played so long. Actually grew interest in the sport around the same age as Marco. Nice to meet you, Pablo. <laughs> What's your Marco name? Babic. What's it? I'm Mark Babbitt, and I'm a writer for the Stippleton Front Porch newspaper. Awesome, man. For about 15 minutes, Marco yeah. picked Pablo's brain. So, number one, when did you start playing soccer? I started playing soccer when I was five years old. He had a chance to ask him about his early years and his inspiration. I told my dad that I want to grow up one day and play for the United States. Yeah. In 2002, he got his shot. Uh, found a way to get to the quarterfinals. When the coach from Team USA gave him a call. The reason he selected me was because of my hard work, and more importantly, when you have 23 players in a locker room, you need guys that are going to get along with everyone. And uh, I, I fit that bill, so. Then again, in 2006, he got to play again after spending four years on a national team. I was pretty much a mainstay at the time. Cool. Now as the captain of the How Colorado Rapids, Pablo has a lot of time to reflect cool. on his World Cup experience. How did you feel representing the U.S. on the world stage? Uh, it's truly one of the greatest feelings uh, one can have. If you ask Pablo and Marco who their favorites are, they'll tell you the U.S. first and then this. Uh, I just like... Uh, Argentina, the way Argentina plays. In the end, Pablo and Marco have a mutual favorite team in Team USA, but we'll be keeping a close eye on Argentina. For NAHA, this is Paul Barron. The World Cup ends July 11th, and stay tuned this Sunday when Mexico and Argentina take the field. And did you know Denver is home to the largest single site brewery in the world? But there's also a growing number of microbreweries. Digital reporter Brian Munoz will tell us why Denver perhaps is the real king of beers. Boulder, home to a brewer's call, the microbrewery revolution. That today is seeing a resurgence, thanks to the recession. We're here in our bottling line room. Our bottling line is a tri-block. Avery Brewing has been around since 1993, and this year, their sales grew 10%. All of our spent grain, it goes to a local farmer who picks it up several times a week to feed to his cattle. So it gets recycled back into the community here. The Home Brewers Association first successfully lobbied for the legalization of home brewing in 1978. The craft is rising in popularity, its director says, as drinkers pinch uh, pennies. Well, yeah. Many of the, the nation's founders, including George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, uh, James Madison, were home brewers. Cheers. Michael Orvin is a home brewer, embodying those revolutionaries modern day recession style. So if you want to brew five gallons of beer, I can do it now for about 25 or $30. And it saves money on beer as well. This former home brewer now runs the Wincoop Brewery. Craft brewing is such a Denver thing that even the mayor got in and started it, providing quality at a cheaper price. We don't have to distribute it through a middleman. And when we, we can our beer here at the Wincoop, deliver it around downtown, to test that Denver is the true home of the much talked about craft, there's only one way to find out. Have a cold one during happy hour in one of Lodo's many drinking establishments. 
Cheers. Oh. Queremos agradecerles por su atención y esperamos que su estadía en la ciudad de las montañas rocallosas haya sido de su agrado. We'll see you next year in Orlando, Florida. Hasta Adiós. luego.